to the latest rendition of Museum Musings. Um, this is our very first uh, filmed episode of Museum Musings, and today we're going to be talking about the Abbott Worsted Company and the exhibit that we have here at the museum. Uh, the Abbott Worsted Company was, uh, was in Westford for about 100 years, from the 1850s to the 1950s. It was in Graniteville, Forge Village, Brookside, which is now Nandasset, and it was also over in Lowell. Um, it became a, a center for, for much activity in Westford, um, and, and we're gonna talk about not only the business and what they did, but also the people in the company and the community that it created around, um, around the business. So um, let's move around here. You can take a look, picture, look at the pictures of Forge Village. Uh, this is what Forge Village looked like about 100 years ago. Uh, this is taken from in front of what is now the village diner, the village breakfast place. Uh, you can see the railroad track running right here. Uh, this is a trolley track, the electric car um, that ran through Westford. And the same picture today where you can see that the, the Abbott Worsted Company dominates the scene. The railroad track is still here, and of course the trolley track is gone. Um, and the bridge is finally open with the, uh, with the nice railroad crossings there. There have been big changes in the past hundred years. What are the biggest questions that people have about, about Abbott was, what was Worsted anyway? Um, what's the big deal about Worsted? And, and here's the answer. Worsted is a way of processing the fibers from the sheep and the um, other animals so that you get a different quality of yarn in the end. This piece of, of wool is carded. It's brushed out so that the fibers are even, but they're not parallel to each other. This fiber has been, there's an additional step where it's been combed out so that all the fibers are parallel to each other. And when that's spun, the resulting yarn is much smoother and actually quite a bit stronger. It's like when you talk about having a worsted suit, it's a much nicer suit than, than just a regular woolen suit. So that's the answer to the worsted question. Let's come around the corner here. Um, we have a couple things here. This is a timeline um, that kind of puts the Abbott Worsted Company into perspective of what was going on in Westford and in the world. Um, it started in 1855 and ceased operations in 1956. Um, let's take my favorite year, which happens to be um, 39, 1939. It's when Kim Kimball's Farm opened in Westford. Um, around that time, uh, um, just this was just before the war, but because of the war, um, the government imposed requirements and the company began to manufacture the fine worsted top that, that we're so familiar with. Um, East Boston Camps had just opened a couple of years ago. The uh, Hindenburg exploded two years before that. The Great Depression was ending and World War II was starting. Um, it was just after the New Deal era with uh, Franklin Roosevelt. So, um, it's interesting to look at how the company changed in response to things that were happening in the town and in the world. Um, now, the Abbott Worsted Company made yarn. They didn't make, um, they didn't knit anything, they didn't weave anything, they just made yarn and that was their product. Um, one of the places that sold their product was Hanley's Yarn Shop. This is um, the Prescott Tavern in Forge Village where, uh, where Spinner's now stands. And, and the yarn shop was right here, and the post office was here. People in town would have um, purchased the yarn, and many of them might have had a machine like this. This is a Gerhardt knitting machine, which is on loan to us for the exhibit from the American Textile History Museum in Lowell. What this does is it knits a tube of, of fabric, and the operator just turns this around, Turns the crank, and this is catching the yarn in successive loops and knitting the tube. And once the tube is knit, they would cut it off, and then they could knit a toe in, 
and cut it and knit heel and bind off the top and have a sock. These were called shaker socks because it was the shakers who, who populated this, uh, made, made the technique popular um, and, and spent a lot of time doing it, producing these shaker socks. But it was also done here in town. Uh, so that's just a, um, a little a way that, that the yarn was used here. And 10 years ago, I'm talking about what, what they did have in the business. Um, they had a lot of big machinery. Uh, these are some examples of the types of things that might have been used specifically at Abbott. Um, back before 1870, when somebody applied for a, a patent, they had to actually supply a working model of the, uh, the thing that they were applying for. Um, so here is, is part of a washing machine. Um, these were all built by C.G. Sargent Company. Um, the second one is a drying machine. It has a screen over the top and a fan underneath that would blow up and dry the wool. The next one is a picking and carding machine. The part that's closest to the camera there is a, uh, a carding machine. Um, you can see that it has little wires sticking up, and as that went around, it would brush out the fibers. So th this was opening up the fibers and evening them out, and a lot of garbage would fall down below. And then, as I mentioned before, when we were talking about what worsted actually was, in order to make worsted, you had to comb it. So the last model is part of a combing machine. Um, and this brush on the front would push the roving into those spikes, and it would, um, it would somehow comb it out. Now, the machines aren't complete because they only had to, um, they only had to produce a model of what was actually being applied for in the patent. So, um, so that part of it is functional, but, but you don't see the whole thing. So C.G. Sargent um, was one of the original uh, partners in the Abbott Worsted Company, but he sold out his interest after about a year, but obviously had to stay involved because he was selling machinery to the company probably throughout its life. Um, the next thing we'll talk about is the business. The Abbott Worsted Company used wool as their raw material and made it into yarn. The wool and other fibers came into the company by train. The train track was right along the side of the buildings, um, and it was delivered into the buildings, into bins, where it was hand-sorted by quality and fineness. Um, through the whole process, the, this, the bins were tracked so that they knew at the end um, exactly what raw materials were used in every final product. Um, then it was, it was picked out, which starts the cleaning process, and then it was scoured or washed. This is a photograph of um, some CG started people actually delivering a washing machine, and you can get a, um, a, some perspective of the scale here of these washing machines um, with, the, with the men sitting there. Uh, it was then dried, and then it went into the carding machines. This is a schematic of uh, the carding machines that Roland Pendleberry made for us. Um, he, actually, he actually worked there and um, knew these machines intimately. So all of these drums, all of these cylinders had the little wire spikes sticking out of them, and they would turn in opposite directions, and some of them would be brushing the fibers out, and some of them would be transferring the wool to subsequent, um, to subsequent rollers. And uh, here's, here's actually a photograph of one, similar to what we're looking at in the schematic, where the wool is coming in the backside, and it's being brushed and brushed and brushed and coming out this end as roving. Then the roving gets fed into drawing machines. Um, drawing and carding were the next processes. The drawing was combining wool and then stretching it out to make it a more homogenous uh, product. And then the combing was aligning the fibers so that they were all aligned parallel to each other. Once it was combed and drawn out thin enough, it was ready to be spun. And here you can see a picture of, of the spinning. There are a lot of women and a few men. Um, the men are dressed in ties, so they were probably supervisors. Um, one of the women would have run um, multiple machines here. So 
maybe up this side and down another would have been run by one person. And they would have to change the bobbins, make sure that everything was working properly. And there would have been mechanics to help them. But, um, but they also would have had a little knowledge of, um, of small repairs on their own machines. Um, these pictures, by the way, were taken by a photographer named um, Penny, which is interesting. Um, but it was P-E-N-N-E-Y. And they were taken in the early 1900s, the first decade of the 1900s. Um, we have a couple scrapbooks with the original photos in them. So that's where all of these came from, most of them. Yeah, quite a nice addition to our collections. Um, here we are in the final stages, the spooling and reeling. So as I said, uh, Abbott's product was yarn. They didn't actually um, knit or weave anything. Uh, they sent out yarn. So once the yarn was spun, then it needed to be put onto reels or spools in order to go to the, the companies that would then use them for knitting or making into rugs or, or whatever. And they were shipped out um, by truck. Here's, a, a, well, in the later years, of course, in the 1940s and 50s, um, they, were, they were sent out by truck. So, so this is the Mill and Forge Village um, with a truck picking up some of the goods. Let's go around to the other side and we'll see a little bit about the family, the people that made up the Abbott Worcester Company. Um, the Abbots are, are a very old family in North America. They actually came over from England in 1644 and then settled originally in Andover. They came to Westford in the 1760s and, and immediately established themselves as real pillars in the community. They were, um, they were school teachers, they were town officers, one served as town clerk, um, they were selectmen. They were soldiers. They fought in, in the American Revolution, the Civil War, many of the different, um, they, they were in the uh, Troop F Cavalry, uh, in the, um, in the, right around the turn of the century. Um, the, ones, the ones who started the Abbott Worsted Company were John W.P. Abbott and his son, John W. Abbott, along with C.G. Sargent. Now, um, John's younger son, Adil, eventually get, got involved, and then also Edward M. Abbott, who is his grandson, um, was the final president of the company when it closed in, in 1956, and he unfortunately died in 1958. Um, so they were they were active in the community and they cared about the community. Um, when I was interviewing people in preparation for this exhibit, one of the things that, that people told me about was how every Christmas the Abbots would send Christmas presents to all of the school children in town, not just the ones that were in Forge Village and Graniteville, but all over the whole town. And um, so they, they remember that and, you know, they were, um, an influential family in town, but I think it was a very positive influence all the way through. Um, they created a community, as I said before. Um, this is an aerial shot of Graniteville, and of course, C.G. Sargent had a big role in Graniteville, and the Granite companies did too. Um, they built a lot of houses that were, lent out, were rented out to employees. These are the buildings that Abbott rented in Granite Valley. You can see the Methodist Church here. Uh, this is over in Forge Village, right across um, Prescott's, uh, Pleasant Street from the mill. It, it stood between Pond Street and Bradford Street, um, and it was just a tenement building that people could rent out. There were also houses that people could rent. This is on Pleasant Street in Forge Village, um, and these were little postcards that were made, were made up so that people who came to live here um, could send postcards to their friends and relatives and, and tell them what a great place Forge Village and Graniteville were to live and why they should come and work at the Abbott Worsted Company. Um, some of the other things they had, um, there was an Abbott Hall over on Bradford Street. Um, maybe we could take a look at the insurance plan. So this is a, an insurance plan from 1912 of the Forge Village Mills. This is Pleasant Street and the railroad track running this way. So this is where that tenement house was that I pointed out the, the uh, picture.
picture of. The office is right across the street here. Um, and this is what is now being developed into apartments. Uh, the people of Forge Village are generally happy about that, seeing the mills being used for something uh, rather than just sitting there. Um, this is um, a top-down view. You can see what was Union Street is now East Prescott Street. Um, and the bridge right here that is finished. Um, and the Abbott Hall was right over here on Bradford Street. Over in Graniteville, um, this, is, this is Broadway, and this is North Main Street. Uh, this is a little bit earlier. This is back in 1890, so this is before they purchased the buildings over in Forge Village. There's, their office buildings were right here. That building is no longer there. Um, I think that's where there's a marker now, like, welcome to Graniteville, something like that. Um, and then the bridge that was completed a few years ago. So those were the buildings uh, in Graniteville. Um, so the Abbott Hall was a place where people got together. It was a, it was a uh, function hall, a social center for Forge Village and the people from Graniteville as well. Um, they showed movies there. This is a little movie billet of the movies that were going to be going on over a period of about a month. Um, they had parties there. There was a cafeteria there where people could um, have lunch during their lunch break from work. The Abbott Worsted Company band practiced there. The company provided their uniforms, the music, and the instruments, and the directors, and, um, and then the people came and played. And it looks like they've got people of all ages there. Uh, it was quite prominent in town. Played at the Apple Blossom Festivals, and um, people that I talked to remember them in the parades. Uh, quite a centerpiece. The other thing that Abbott did was they promoted uh, sports teams. Um, these are a couple of pictures. This is from uh, a baseball team in 1922. And this is a, uh, a soccer, <coughs> excuse me, a soccer team. I'm not sure what year this was, um, but Abbott actually was actively recruited people from England, um, Scotland, Russia, Poland. Um, they recruited French Canadians to come, and they recruited those people. Number one, because um, they knew that they had experience in the textile industry, and so they'd, they'd be good for the company. But also they recruited them for the appeal of playing on the Abbott soccer team. <laughs> and everybody uh, who talks to me about the exhibit remembers, remembers the ball teams that they had. Yeah. All right. um, another thing that Abbott provided for their employees was was health insurance. Um, before before we, they really had health insurance, uh, they had a hospital. And so whenever employees got hurt, they would just send them over to the hospital. The hospital is now a private, it was built as a private dwelling, and is now a private dwelling again, over on Pleasant Street. Um, it, it's um, an early building, but it, it's been uh, made more modern. It has four chimneys. Um, a chimney on each corner. Um, I think it's number 10 Pleasant Street now. But that was where the hospital was. And um, so people remember going over and, and picking up their medicines that they needed. This was actually a bottle of calamine lotion uh, for somebody who got poison ivy a little too often. Um, and then, of course, when, when health insurance um, became the norm, they provided health insurance for the employees and their families. Um, this is kind of an interesting book here while we're talking about health insurance. This is an accident log from 1889. And on the left-hand side here, you see uh, the record of a girl named Kate Larkin, who is at Graniteville, and she cut her hand on the broken blade of a knife. Um, it's interesting to note here that the company makes a point in all of these entries of putting some statement like this. The accident was the result of the girl's carelessness. Um, just to make sure that everybody understands that it was not the company's fault. Then they do note that the insurance company was notified and that there was a settlement. And over on the other page is 
a record of the settlement. Now, since Kate Larkin was underage, her father came in. And this says, I, John Larkin of Greneville, blah, 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 uh, have received from the Abbott Company one and fifty one hundred dollars in full satisfaction of all claims for compensation on account of the injuries that his daughter received. And it goes on, blah, 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 in legalese. And he had to sign that at the bottom, saying that was all he was going to get. So a dollar fifty is what he got for his daughter's injury. Now, to put that into perspective, over here is a payroll log from around, this is um, March 1888. So it's about a year and a half before the accident log. And um, if we just look at, at um, one set of entries here, these are the people who worked in the washing room. There were four of them. They worked, uh, most of them worked 109, hour, 109 hours over a period of two weeks, so about 54 hours a week. Um, and they were getting between eight cents and 15 cents an hour. Um, and that multiplies out, so every two weeks, um, they were getting between $8 and $16 for their pay. So it, for Kate Larkin, $1.50 might have been a couple days' pay, so it might have compensated her for missing a couple of days of work. The other thing on here is you can see that um, a couple of these people were, must have been living in uh, company-owned houses and paying rent. So this first one, who was probably the supervisor, had a house that was $9, so his take-home pay then was $7.35. And his family then would have lived with him, so he was the only one that the rent was being taken out for. Um, so that kind of puts all the the money things into perspective uh, earlier in the company's history. This wonderful exhibit here is another thing that we have from the Textile Museum over in Lowell. It's an advertising display for the Abbott Worsted Company. Um, and one thing that's interesting about it is that Abbott just made yarn. They didn't, um, they didn't dye yarn. They didn't make rugs. But they... They have examples of what could be done with their yarn in this display. And you can see that there's um, not only wool up here, but also mohair, um, some of the yarn, some of the fibers processed at different points along the way, um, the carded, and then the combed, and then the drawn out roving that we talked about in the pictures. Uh, you can also see at the bottom, we know that this was um, after 1953 by looking up some of these synthetics that are listed on here. Um, but they did get into synthetics at the very end of the company's lifespan in, in Massachusetts. Um, some Dacron, Dynal, Vicara. Um, and so they were, they were trying to keep up with the, with the times. The mill buildings today over in Forge Village are being um, made into apartment buildings. There's a developer, Chris Yule, who is doing that. I have a photo over here. Of, um, these are some excavations that are going on in building two. They're, they're actually digging out an entire level down below what was there, and this will become the parking garage. And that was the first step in developing this whole park-like complex. And that courier company is still over here, and, and they'll be staying in some of the buildings on the side. Um, so this is the building that's being excavated for the parking, and then all of this and the office building will become apartments. So that's the Abbott Worsted Company in a nutshell. I think you can see how the company and the people had such an impact on Westford. Um, there are houses around town, um, like the old Abbott Estate uh, over on um, Main Street in Graniteville, uh, there's the Abbott School that was named after this company that opened right about the time when the mill closed in Westford. Um, and, and there's Abbott Street in Westford. It's, it's the evidence of the, of the business and the company are everywhere. Um, this exhibit was uh, put together by the Historical Society, but also we had a lot of people helping out with it. The American Textile History Museum was very generous in loaning us some some key items from their collections. Um, I encourage everybody to, to visit them. Uh, at some point, uh, we got a grant from the Local Cultural Council, which is a um, subset of the Massachusetts Cultural Council that helped us 
uh, that enabled this exhibit. Um, so those, it, you know, it just wouldn't have been possible to, to do this without that. Um, the museum, this exhibit is closing, but the museum is open on Sunday afternoons. We have rotating exhibits in this space. So every time you come, if you come every few months, um, this exhibit will change. Uh, this particular one has been in for seven months. We had the, uh, all the third graders in town, 20 classes of third graders come through in October. Had a lot of fun with them, and we'll have something else in for them next year. Uh, so people should come on Sunday afternoon, check out the museum, and uh, see the other static exhibits that we have as well. Um, the office is also open during the week, usually Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 9 to 1. And you're welcome to make an appointment to come and see the museum if you can't make it on Sunday afternoons. We have lots of research facilities for genealogical research, house research, um, all kinds of things over in the office. So thanks for joining us today at, at Museum Musings.